Rita, this morning, I think you have heard numerous times from the reading and uh, from the story for all ages that Unitarian Universalists draw from many sources in the search for meaning and understanding. And as I reflect on the sources that have inspired my own journey and that I have used in worship, I recognize that there have been gaps. I use limited sources by the global majority. Now, I don't know if you've heard that expression, but I will make a little aside and share that I heard a colleague use this term, people of the global majority, a few years ago. And I find it to be more affirming, inclusive, and accurate. It doesn't define me by the color of my skin. And that is something that I appreciate when I talk about people like me. So I use the term global majority as a reminder that the majority of the earth's population is not white. In fact, whiteness is not a global norm. So one of my goals in ministry, when I craft worship and when I oversee lifespan religious exploration in my congregation has been bringing in voices of the global majority alongside traditional, mostly Eurocentric voices. Why? To deepen my and our understanding of the sacred and the diverse stories of the communities that we are widening the circle to embrace. And so that brings me to Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, because she is an example of one of those voices that I have discovered on my journey. And as you heard in the children's story, she was a Catholic nun, and I will call her Sor Juana. Sor means sister in Spanish. In 17th century uh, Nueva España or New Spain, where she lived, and that is modern Mexico, Sor Juana did a lot of writing and she did a lot of thinking. And she is considered by some religious scholars as the first female theologian in Latin America. Although she embraced Catholic teachings, she questioned the treatment of women and indigenous people by the church and wrote about her own understandings of biblical reading. Now that was controversial in the 1600s. Today, she is mostly known for her secular poems and prose depicting life in Nueva España. And her image has even been, oops, a little technical glitch there. Her image has even been depicted in numerous bills in Mexico something that we haven't been able to do to have a woman on our currency here in the States. So she was well known and has been well known and yet I had never heard of her. And I actually discovered her when I was in seminary and had to be in Chicago during a lot of those cold January snowy winters. And after classes, I would binge on Netflix. And one of the Netflix series that I discovered was Sor Juana. And it was in Spanish. So that was pretty cool because I got to practice my Spanish just listening to it. And so after I watched the whole series, um, it inspired me to learn about her life and to read her work. And I was really impressed with her intelligence, her wit, and the fearless expression of her opinions. Because remember, her life, like that of many women of the global majority then and now, was constrained by white supremacy culture and its intersection with classism and sexism. Sor Juana's persistence and courage invites us 
to consider our commitments to justice and the challenges of staying the course in the face of institutional resistance. This morning, we'll consider the similarities in the struggle against racism and sexism she faced then that sadly persist today. So let's go back to the 1600s. Sor Juana lived in a time of strict racial hierarchy based on birthplace and skin color. White Spaniards and Criollos, people of white Spanish parents born outside of Spain, were at the top of the hierarchy. And at the bottom were mestizo, mulatto, black and indigenous people. Now, Sor Juana was a criolla. She was born in Nueva España, but she had privilege because her parents were born in Spain. And as you heard in the story, becoming a nun allowed her to pursue her studies and theological interests. She often wrote on commission and was able to afford an extensive library and live comfortably in a convent in Mexico City. Today, the legacy of the racial stratification of Nueva España continues in Mexican society and other former Spanish colonies, including Colombia, where I was born. It continues in the anti-Blackness that I witnessed and internalized when I lived there and continued to maintain even when I came to this country and have been working to decolonize myself from. Here in the United States, the anti-Blackness persists too. And the pandemic has drawn more attention to health and economic inequities that over time have left marginalized people, people more vulnerable to disease and unemployment. As a denomination that aspires to be anti-racist, learning the history of the creation of race and the hidden stories of the global majority and other oppressed identities is part of the work that we are called to do. Now, although Sor, Sor Juana had privilege because she was a criolla, her gender and birth to an unwed mother kept her at the margins. One of her most well-known poems, Hombres Necios, or Foolish Men, calls out the double standard toward women at the time. Sor Juana also used her writing to question the exclusion of women from educational and theological pursuits. She wrote, private and individual study, who has forbidden that to women? Like men, do not women have a rational soul? Is a woman's soul not as receptive to God's grace and glory as a man's? Now today that statement is not radical, but in the 1600s, it was for a nun to write and it was dangerous. And later on, we'll see how dangerous. Sor Juana was also ahead of her time in using poetry, drama, and prose as public forms of theological expression. Her work was commissioned by the Spanish royal court, the viceroy that you heard of in the story, and it was also used for religious public ceremonies. And one thing that's really particular to Sor Juana as a writer in the 1600s is that she incorporated indigenous language, perspectives, and traditions, something that was unheard of at the time. Now, in terms of her theological wonderings, she wrote a letter critiquing a local sermon which led to her being censored by the local bishop. Because at that time, women were not allowed to interpret biblical passages, speak about them 
or much less write about them. And so Sor Juana, not being intimidated, wrote a long and forceful response to the bishop advocating for women's rights and freedom of expression. This is part of what she wrote. That I preferred an opinion contrary to that of the father of the church, Father Vieira, was audacious. But, but as a father, was it not audacious to speak against the three holy fathers of the church? My reason, such as it is, is not as unfettered as his, as both issue from the same source. Is his opinion to be considered as a revelation that we must accept it blindly? Now this frankness <laughs> did not win her favor with the church. She wrote during the time of the Inquisition and was eventually coerced into signing a series of documents pledging loyalty to the church, asking for forgiveness and renouncing her writing. She did retreat to monastic life and died at the age of 46 as a result of the plague which spread to the convent of San Jeronimo where she lived. Now, although Sor Juana was ultimately censured, throughout her life, she remained committed to calling out the Catholic Church's marginalization of women and native peoples. Her persistence given the times that she lived in is remarkable. Today, women in many denominations have been welcomed into ministry, ministry and theological education. However, women and those who identify as women continue to face barriers because of their gender in our country and abroad. abroad. In the United States, COVID had a disproportionate impact on women, especially women of the global majority who have most of the caregiving responsibilities and jobs classified as essential. As COVID becomes endemic, the struggle continues to access affordable housing, living wages, good education, and adequate health care. Most recently, the overturn of Roe v. Wade is another example of how religious, sexist, and patriarchal views on sexuality and women's roles in society influence legislative decisions that deny women and trans or binary people who can give birth access to abortion care. And I was so glad to see in your order of service today that the offering will be for the national network of abortion funds, because that is really important work. And I was also encouraged by your postcarding work because here in North Carolina, access to abortion is hanging by a thread. In November's midterm elections, we will know if our state will continue to offer abortions to women. And it is a scary thought to think that it may not, because right now we are a, we only have 14 clinics in the entire state. And we have people coming from Georgia and Tennessee and other states to access abortion care. So you might even consider doing some postcarding in states like ours, whose right to access health care abortion is on the line. And friends, even before Roe was overturned, intrusive restrictions such as legislated waiting periods, periods and forced ultrasounds implied that women could not be trusted to make health decisions of their own. They cannot be trusted by whom? by sadly a majority male establishment or individuals of a very small 
minority religious perspective around the morality of abortion. So although women have made progress in Sor Juana's time, there is still a lot of work to do. Just as Sor Juana chose to remain committed to challenging the dogmas and injustices of her time, may we also remain committed to challenging ableist, sexist, racial, and other oppressions in our country. That means voting, getting out the vote, and moving beyond our comfortable inner circles. When we build relationships with others and know their stories and about their lives, we are more likely to become co-conspirators and rise up against the oppressions that constrain them. And as we do that work of justice, we are a people grounded in faith. And it is our theology of love and liberation that grounds us during these times when our efforts sometimes may seem futile. But our spiritual and theolo theological grounding keeps us from going to a place of despair. So I invite you as you continue to explore the theology and sources that ground you in your universalist faith, in your work of justice and liberation, I invite you to seek out and welcome diverse stories and voices because there are so many more things that unite us than a lot of the things that we think divide us. So I invite you to widen those circles, to explore your theology and to go forth and work for justice. May it be so. Hi everybody and welcome to our after reflection discussion. My name is Ember Kelly and I'm the Director of Religious Education here at Fourth Universalist. It's so good to be with you all. I use she and her pronouns and so this is a time where we kind of just dive a little bit deeper into the service themes. Reverend Claudia, it's so great to, to have you with, you with me today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Reverend Claudia Jimenez. My pronouns are she, ella, and I just had a wonderful opportunity to preach in your community. And even though I was here, I felt welcomed and I felt heard. And so I thank you for that. Yes, definitely. I, you know, I think it says a lot about our, our technology that we've learned over the pandemic that, that we're able to pull something like that off. And I, I was, I managed to hear some folks chatting and, and yeah, definitely it was, it was, I think your, your message was really appreciated. Um, so we're Thanks. really glad to have you with us. Um, so in terms of, you know, like um, brand, branding names of a, of a service, this was perhaps a bit more um, non-traditional in terms of like a theme. Um, what inspired like, you know, what, why, why this message today? Well, I think, you know, for two reasons. Uh, one reason is that as Unitarian Universalists, we draw on a lot of sources. And traditionally, we're used to sources that are very Eurocentric. And so when I found out about Sor Juana, I was actually in seminary, but I did not learn about Sor Juana in seminary. Actually, when I was in seminary and had long nights after my classes in the cold winters of Chicago, I would binge on Netflix. And I always like listening to Spanish Netflix so that I can practice my Spanish. And I found this series about Sor Juana. It was called Sor Juana. And when I saw it, you know, I thought, who was this woman? And I just delved into her work. I got Octavio Paz, who's a Mexican writer, wrote a volume on Sor Juana, and there were other books about her theology and her life. And I read a lot of her stuff in Spanish in the language in which it was written. And I thought, you know, this is someone that I would love our community to know about because she lived in a difficult time of challenge like we do right now. And despite living in the time of the Inquisition and despite living in a time when women are supposed to be silent and submissive, she pushed back against that and she was a nun. I mean, 
It, how, you know, it doesn't get better than that. What a compelling story. And, you know, as I shared in the sermon, even though sadly she was censored by the, by the bishop and she ended up having to recant, she got a lot of her work out there. And, um, and we have some of it to read today. And I just find that compelling. And it's a challenge to us, like, where are there other voices? You know, for some of us, it can be Star Trek. You know, it, it, it can be other, it can be film, it can be poetry, it can be other writings um, and people whose lives are grounded in, in spirituality in a larger sense of the spiritual, not a deity centered, but an attentiveness and a presence and a questioning and curiosity. So, you know, a Netflix series introduced me to someone that I found out was considered one of the first Latin American theologians mm. and has basically been ignored. Uh, a woman, a Latina, you know, and that's not what we listen to. So I think it's time to kind of disrupt that complacency with just what we've been told over and over are the lo loci of knowledge and inspiration. Oh, I, I agree. Those were some of my favorite classes in, in seminary were the ones where they're like, hey, here, here is here is this um, thinker that you've never heard of before, but um, and it's not the the traditional um, the traditional voice. So it's, it's so important because I mean I think there's a lot of truth to what you say there about that. Are you know we 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 think of these sources the six sources is very expansive, but it's so easy, especially in the United States, to just kind of default that like oh well who are these voices we're listening to? It's uh, let's Ralph Waldo Emerson. Let's uh, you know um, the these white cisgendered men who have been Unitarian Universalist before us, they, it kind of, uh, it, it can be really easy to just fall into the habits of listening to the same right. people. Right. And I think it's a, you know, it's a both and. It's a yes, there is wisdom from our Eurocentric ancestors and those voices. And we are living in a time where we realize that we have ignored other voices because of the culture and the systems that we are in. So it really is an opportunity to disrupt that. And I think it's important to hold that both and, because even some of our ancestors, like, I don't know, like Channing, for example, you know, there was a lot of goodness to Channing and there's a shadow side to Channing. We don't just throw out Channing because of his shadow side. And I think that more personally, that allows us to be gracious with ourselves because we are not going to be perfect. We are going to have a shadow side and we don't just throw out every individual that has a shadow side because you know what? There'd be nobody left, you know? Because even Sor Juana, you know, she, she was all about speaking up for women and indigenous people and she was a Catholic and believed in the dogmas of her time and in her own way supported oppression even of women and indigenous people. And she was living in that tension. Right. And I think that's what we are in, called into is really to live with the tension and not see people as disposable because they are imperfect, you know? Mm -hmm. Cause that really makes it difficult for us to do the work of justice that we need, because if we think we have to be perfect in order to work for justice or to reach out to uh, members of the global majority, then we're never going to do it because we're going to be, oh, I can't, I'm going to make a mistake. And we have to be in places of courage and, and bravery where we say, okay, I'm willing to do the work and I'm willing to listen. When, right. when I make a mistake, I'm, I'm going to stay present. I'm mm -hmm. going to figure out how do we recovenant here? Because isn't that what covenanting is about? Being able to recovenant when we break covenant. And don't we do that a lot? <laughs> Community is, you know, being able to hold things in tension. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so if somebody, so I guess it could be maybe two parts. Mm -hmm. If somebody wants to maybe read more about her, um, mm -hmm. like what might you recommend? And were there any books that you really drew from specifically for, for this message? Oh, I'm going to grab my little pile. Hold on. <laughs> I do have a couple um, of sources that I used. And one of my favorite sources is called A Reader in Feminist Theology. Ooh. 
a reader in feminist, in Latina feminist theology. And uh, it's edited by, my, by my, Maria Pilar Aquino and others. And, you know, here you will discover the first chapter is about Sor Juana, but you will discover other voices that probably you are not familiar with. And even though a lot of them are Christian based, there is, there is a progressiveness and an expansive, expansiveness there. And I think for me, what this does is it calls me to remember that our roots as Unitarian Universalists are Christian. Hmm. And, and we need to, to think about, you know, what does it mean to be part of a tradition that is rooted in Christianity? And what is the message of Jesus? What is the message of the gospel that is still, that can be life affirming? We don't have to reject everything. So this is, you know, this is a great resource. And then I mentioned Octavio Paz, and I don't know how many of you will want to read this, but I did read this. Um, and Octavio Paz does a good job. And the, the hesitation I have with him is that he does it from his social location as a male, a cisgender male, who is a product of Mexican culture. So he brings a lot of richness to it. And then there's also a lot of opportunity to kind of look at whose voice is telling this story? What is the lens that is bringing us Sor, Sor Juana? My favorite resource is actually somebody's dissertation. And uh, it's, a, it's a theologian named Michelle Gonzalez and her book, which I found on Amazon in the used section is Sor Juana, Beauty and Justice in the Americas. And this really gave me some deeper insights into the challenges um, of Sor Juana's time and also the notion of beauty, of using poetry, of using art, of really creating public theology to bring the word out to people. So that was cool. And then of course there are a lot of, this is Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz is the title. It's a penguin collection of her writings in Spanish. And so I, I did have a fun time reading her work in Spanish. And so here's the caveat. She lives during the Baroque time. And so her writing is really flowery and uh, just very Baroque. And so I think, you know, even when I chose things to that, that were translated, reading the whole poem or the whole piece sometimes sadly is kind of nauseating because of the way the language is used and it's just too much description and flowery stuff, but there's a kernel to it. And so I was challenged to like, stay the course, find the kernel. <laughs> oh, you mentioned the Baroque thing and it made me, there was, uh, uh, I'm, I'm very active on TikTok. And I remember seeing uh -huh. a video that was like talking about like Baroque architecture and how <laughs> how over the top it was. And I'm like, oh, yes. my God, okay, this makes sense, this makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it is, you know, it is over the top, but I, you know, I still think like when I read her response to that bishop, you know, basically what happened was that that priest wrote a sermon where he took the writings of three of the church fathers, St. Augustine was one of them, and he critiqued them. And so Sor Juana listened to that sermon and she disagreed with him. And then she wrote her own understanding of you, because I think the theme was what are God's greatest gifts to humanity or something like that. And they each used one of, you know, each of the church fathers had a position on that. And this bishop attacked them all and said, no, it's wrong because it's wrong because it's wrong because. And then Sor Juana disagreed and she, you know, and she wrote about it. And that was sacrilegious, you know? And so she was like a thinker and a questioner and that she continued to write even after the bishop gave her a hard time. And then there were other letters that were written criticizing her. And, you know, she, she held her ground until finally she was forced to sign papers and recant. But despite that, you know, how many of us are willing to take those kinds of risks for the work of justice that we are called to do today, when we actually have more opportunities to speak up and to talk about our values. Because that's the other thing, you know, we tend to do justice work, but we don't always center the values and the faith that propels us mm. to fight for bodily autonomy, to fight for liberation, right? And, and I think that that groundedness is what we offer 
that the Sierra Club doesn't offer, that, you know, all these other justice movements, they're part of the picture, but the spiritual grounding and the deepening we get in our faith communities. I got like so many, yeah. <laughs> uh, besides feeling tempted, every one of those books to just uh, sneak open my browser over here, <laughs> especially, you know, like as a seminarian and a seminary graduate, I am tempted on the, the giant collection. Yes. <laughs> what, what is life without, you know, a few giant theology collections? Oh. No kidding. <laughs> and there are quite a few. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for challenging us to think about where we get our wisdom from, what voices we can be listening to. This was really uh, a beautiful chance to get to talk. Thank you. And thanks for the opportunity. And I hope maybe next time I'll see you all in the flesh. <laughs> Let's do it. Take care. <laughs> Blessings to you and your ministry. <laughs>